Mm. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'll start off by uh, giving you an idea of how we got trained, what the glider pilots were like, and then we'll go more into the detail of the operation itself. Yeah. Airborne Forces really started in April 1940. This is a river on the Belgian border, and it was where the Germans had decided to make the breakthrough but you can see it was overlooked by this fort. These are the walls of the fort. But the Germans wanted to come across here, so they'd obviously got to get rid of that fort. And they did it by landing gliders in the middle. And if you can see these little sort of blotches here, they are in fact gliders that landed inside the bounds of the fort, captured it, cleared the way for the Germans to sweep across the river and move on into France and the of course, you all know what happened after that. Well, this caused consternation amongst the British camp, and Churchill gave the edict that we will have airborne armies, airborne forces. And so they were to comprise uh, gliders and paratroops, and they all started building up at the beginning of 1940. <coughs> I joined them in August 42. We were all volunteers as glider pilots, came from all regiments of the British Army, and we were posted to this new regiment, glider pilot regiment, and for six weeks, from whatever regiment we'd come, and I was a Royal Engineers running railways and trains and maintaining steam locomotives, we were turned into tough fighting infantrymen, ready to do anything once we got to the scene of the operation. We were taught to pow fly powered aircraft, first of all, the little Tiger Moths and a Miles monoplane called the Magister. We went on to these little seven-seater gliders and were taught to fly those, and then we moved on to this one, the Hawser, which was the main one of the airborne forces. 88-foot wingspan, 64 feet front to back, nose to tail, if you like. Tricycle undercarriage, and we could carry 29 troops or a jeep and a light gun or jeeps and motorbikes or anything up to 6,000 pounds payload. That's, we could carry that. And I say this was the main workhorse of the uh, Airborne Army to carry the, the troops. That's a picture of the cockpit layout, very, very basic as you can see. Control columns, uh, rudder bar at the front there. It, we had a very rudimentary instru instrument panel. We had an altimeter, an airspeed indicator, a turner bank indicator, a compass, and a thing there called a blind flying instrument. We, we termed it the angle of dangle because what... <laughs> we, you see, the trouble was... You were on the end of a 300-foot tow rope, and w when we were being towed, we had to keep formation on the tug. If you got out of position, you, you pulled his tail up or pulled his tail down or pulled it to one side, and usually they got very upset, and there was a, there was a telephone cable t wrapped up in the tow rope, and the pilot would, would, fly, would call up and say, would you mind getting into position? Or words to that effect. <laughs> so what, what was done was, was where the tow rope came back as one rope and about 20 feet in front of the cockpit, it divided into two and it was fastened one under each wing. And from the centre of the knot where it split, they had a piece of bungee elastic and it came back and there was a rod projected out of the back of that instrument there and they fastened this to the elastic and then as you flew behind the tug, if you were in the correct position, there were two needles in that instrument there, one horizontal and one vertical. Now if you could keep those needles crossed exactly in the middle of the dial, then you knew, although you might not be able to see the tug if it had gone into cloud or something like that, but you knew you were roughly in the right position. Didn't work. But, <laughs> but, 
or, or not, not very well. And, and it had one sort of rather annoying fault that when you released from the tug, you pulled a lever down here and the, and the tow rope released. This bit of elastic, which was fastened to the tow rope by a big snap fastener, would get longer and longer and longer until it <laughs> gave up the ghost, said enough of that, flew back, punched a hole in the perspex of the cockpit, and you got air conditioning whether you wanted it or not. <laughs> you so we, we, we found that they weren't very good. Now, I said we had jeeps, we used to carry jeeps and things, and this was the rather... Uh, sort of heavy method of getting it in. The, the, well, on the preparations for the, the uh, operation, all the gliders were towed up to one of these ramps which was positioned round the field. The jeep would be driven up the ramp and stopped in the doorway there. There's a, there's a doorway which would take the ramp. And working together, the team of men would start bouncing it on its spring. And every time it came up in the air, you turned it a bit more and you turned it a bit more and you turned it a bit more until you got it lined up to drive down the body of the glider. Now, then on the floor, you'd put metal troughs, which the wheels would ride in, and you would push this down the glider to the end as far as it would go. And there, there it waited until you landed. Now, when you lay in, you've got to get the thing out. And, and they hadn't, I mean, we couldn't fly over there and drop those all around the field that we were going to land in. It would rather give the game away, wouldn't it, if we put up. <laughs> so what we did, what you had to do, round the tail were four bolts which held the tail on. You had to undo those, and it fell off, and you dragged it to one side. There were a pair of wire cutters there, which you cut the control cables. You just pulled the tail to one side, took these metal troughs, laid them down out the back and drove the jeep down it, you see, and that was, all sounds simple, doesn't it? <laughs> but the one, there were lots of sort of snags with it, and the story is that one day they'd done a demonstration for Majesty, His Majesty the King and Queen with the two princesses, and they were standing sort of by one of these ramps watching the lads put the jeep in the glider, and one of the fellows left his fingers in rather a silly place. And he mentioned this to his friend. Again, your words to that effect. <laughs> and the story is that the Queen Mother said, well, I suppose they do get frustrated sometimes. Because <laughs> <laughs> the, other, the other snag was, it was all very well standing there doing, uh, undoing these bolts and fiddling about to take the nuts off. But I mean, if somebody's taking umbrage to your being there and trying to get rid of you, you don't want to be too long doing that. So somebody came up with the bright suggestion that if where the, the body section and the um, tail section were joined, if they put a ring of gun cotton around there and a button in the cockpit, as soon as you touch down, if you push the button, you could blow the tail off and get the jeep out and without having to stand there undoing all these bolts. Well, that was all right unless you got some keen type who blew the tail off ten feet in the air. <laughs> <laughs> you rather lost control of the stability of the glider. But anyway, that, that was how we got the jeeps on and how we got the jeeps off. It was a bit of a dicey procedure, but never mind. Now, this is what we were practising all through the winter, the, the autumn and the winter of 1943-1944. Mass landings on other aerodromes in this country. It was all done in this country. And, and you've seen an aerodrome, I mean, you've got your main runways and, and you get... So the, the, the main runways there, and what, what you do, we, of the, the Glider Pilot Regiment, we lived on the same aerodrome as our tug squadron. And the, or the exercises would be organised that gliders from one particular aerodrome, say Stony Cross, like the one I was on, would land in that area. Uh, gliders from Bryars Norton would land in that area. Gliders from Aldermaston in there, Fairford in there. And 
all the troops, the airborne troops, would all go off and do their exercise, and tugs from the uh, our parent aerodrome would come at some later time, retrieve the gliders, and we'd go back and get ready for the next exercise. And this is where the differential brakes came useful, because you can see how close some of these gliders are, and if you could steer around them and avoid crashing into them, it was much better for all concerned, really. <laughs> what used to happen, you see, we, we used to fly in a long stream of, at 2,000 feet, tugs and gliders, at about 2,000 feet. And when you could see where you were going to land and you could see the landing zone, you'd pick the spot that you were going to land on and everything would be fine until the last minute when some other clock would sort of get the bit of grass that you wanted and, and you had to steer around him. So that's where the differential brakes came in, very useful. But as I say, this is what we were practising all through the autumn of, of 1943 and into 1944. Now, one of the beauties of gliders was that you could land troops in concentrated numbers. Now, if you dropped 180 paratroops, you spread them all over the country. It takes ages for them to gather again. And so that's why we used the gliders. But, of course, in order to achieve that, you've got to get all the gliders there almost at the same time, which means you've got to get them airborne all at the same time. And this is the way we used to do it. All the gliders were lined up on the runway, all the tugs were lined up each side, and the tow ropes from the tugs were connected to their respective gliders. When time to go arrived, a series of signals were passed from the, the chap standing by the glider to the tug at the front here, and he would open up his throttles, move off slowly until the tow rope was tight, when the chap at the back would pass this signal forward to where the tug pilot could see it, he'd push open the throttle, away they went, and as soon as that moved, the chap from that side would, would taxi onto the runway, tow his glider off, then the one like that, and we would go down the line until we'd got all the gliders off, and we could do one about every 30 seconds to 45 seconds. So you can see we could always arrive in a concentrated group when we got there. And so this, this was the, the other bit that went towards these operational uh, exercises that we had. Now, one day in, in April 1944, our squadron commander sent for uh, six of us in our squadron and in another squadron um, on another aerodrome, six chaps were sent for there and told that we could forget all about this flying at 2,000 feet and being towed and seeing where we were going to land. We were going to do something quite different. We were going to fly up to 6,000 feet. We'd, we'd never heard of this, not being towed at 6,000 feet. And we were going to land in a very small field, about half the size of a football pitch. We were going to do it at night, <laughs> with no lights. He didn't give us a chance to say, would you rather not? <laughs> and so, um, and so we, we started practising, but there were some snags. And the first thing they said to us was, well, it's no good flying empty gliders. They said, you won't get the feel of them. You won't know. We won't know whether you'll be able to glide that far and all that. So we'd better put some weight in the gliders. Now, you've heard of the Bailey Bridge, you know, that prefabricated bridge. So they took some sections of that weighing six, that were made up a load of 6,000 pounds and put them in the gliders. And we said, well, yeah, that's all right, but if we are doing this at night and, and for some reason we come unstuck and we stop rather quickly, uh, 6,000 pounds of Bailey Bridge in the back of your neck is not, <laughs> not conducive to feeling all right, you see, so <laughs> we said we don't like that. So they came back another day and said, we've cracked it, we know what we're going to do. We're going to put concrete blocks on the floor <laughs> and so that if you stop suddenly and you lift your feet up, they'll all shoot out <laughs> underneath you. <laughs> so we started off practising for that and... 
this is where uh, the, the, we had a do with this angle of dangle business. <laughs> the first tug aircraft we started doing this with was a thing called an Albemarle, which was a twin engine aircraft. It wasn't much good. The story is we gave some to Russia for lease lend and they, all they did was took the engines off and used them and threw the airframe away, but <laughs> they weren't much good. They couldn't climb very well. And we were trying to get up to 6,000 feet and there were lovely big puffy clouds all around us and he tried to get over them and under them and round them and he couldn't. And so he disappeared into cloud, you see, and I tried to fly on this angle of dangle thing, but it didn't work. So I cast off and we came out of the cloud and because what used to happen, we, we used to fly in the Seven Valley a lot and around that area and there were aerodromes all over the place which while you were flying on tow, you could see everything. There was always an aerodrome that you thought, well, if I need to get down, I'll get down on that, you see. But while you were in the cloud, some rotten sun so moved all those aerodromes. So <laughs> when, when, you, when you came out, there weren't any there and you just had to pick a field and hope for the best. And we, Peter, my second pilot, and I, we saw this lovely big piece of green. We thought, oh, that's fine, we'll land there to find we'd landed on a village green somewhere in the Newbury area. We, we'd stopped outside the pub and the pub was open. So we said, well, that's... <laughs> that's 100% success, if you like. <laughs> but our, our feeling of merriment was quickly subdued because we saw an RAF officer on his bicycle pedalling like fury across this village green to come towards us, so we thought we're in trouble now. But he turned out to be a pilot from Coastal Command, flew Sunderland. He'd heard about our gliders and please could he have a look at the glider and please could he buy us a pint? So that was all right. <laughs> anyway, we, we kept practising but they decided that they'd got to do something better to get up, us up to 6,000 feet in a, in a fairly short time. So we were moved from Bryce Norton where we were at the time down to a place called Tarrant Rushton, which is down near Bournemouth, not a great distance from here. And um, we were towed then by big Halifax tugs and they could whip us up to 6,000 feet as easy as anything and uh, no bother at all. And, and so we went down there and we began to practice at night landing back on the aerodrome, very much like those mass landings I showed you, on the grass in between the runways. And what happened one night, we took off and we were flying to the release point. The, the RAF had worked this out. They worked out where we'd got to be released, which courses we'd got to fly, which would take us into this small field. But one night they let us go in the wrong place and we could see, although there were no lights on the aerodrome, you could always see a bit at night and we could see that we weren't going to get into the aerodrome because they let us go in the wrong place. So we searched for a field to, to touch down in, and we did touch down, but we finished up across the local lane, you see. But there we are, we, uh, we kept going, and uh, gradually we, we perfected it until we were ready to go. Then, there we go, 11 o'clock, night of June the 5th, we got ready, got the invasion. Oh, every Allied aircraft in the invasion had those white stripes painted round the wings and the body. And that's the big Halifax that was towing us off and there, there's one of the gliders in the background there. And so we took off, 11 o'clock, flew to the French coast. We got there and the RAF had worked out the courses that we'd got to fly. The navigator called us up on the, the intercom over the tow rope and said, you know, that's it, off you go, best of luck. We cast loose. Peter, my second pilot, had a little lamp on the tip of his finger and a battery on his belt. He had a map and he had the courses. And it was up to him. Oh, he had a stopwatch as well. And we had to fly each course for so many minutes and so many seconds. And we flew the first long leg and then Peter told me to turn onto the second leg and it was on that crosswind leg that we saw the bridge. And 
There we are, with three of us have arrived. You can see the bridge down the bottom corner there. That's the nearest glider to the bridge, and if you work out that that wingspan is 88 feet, you see we weren't a great distance from the bridge. There's a second glider in the middle there, which is mine. I should have been up the top, but apparently when we were going in, we, that one and myself, we got pretty close together, so we veered off, and I finished in the middle, and he finished up over there. Unfortunately, that lighter patch in front of my glider is a pond which we went into, and I remember this terrible crash and bash and the whole front of the cockpit disintegrated, and I realised that I was sort of underwater and didn't think there was much of a future in that, so I struggled out. Apparently, I dragged out my second pilot but then uh, I was concussed, didn't really know what I was doing, staggered about and, and I got shot. Whether it was friendly fire or not, we don't know, but they say that it possibly was because I was a bit slow in giving the password, but I don't remember anything. I remember this terrible crash and lots of water and that's about the end of it. But there we are, we got there, we landed there. Within 10 minutes, the troops had all jumped out the gliders, rushed down to the bridge, captured it, the other bridge, which is just off the picture, had been captured and within 10 minutes both of them were in our hands and uh, everything was safe. That's mine, I'm afraid that's rather bent, isn't it? <laughs> it's, uh, but there you are. Unfortunately, one chap was killed in the, in the landing. Um, the, the, the undercarriage broke off and he got trapped inside. But uh, apart from that, he was the only casualty, which was pretty good. But you could see how they broke up, couldn't you? They were only plywood. If somebody said to you, you're going to fly a wooden aeroplane with no engine six miles in the dark and land in a field with no light. <laughs> you wouldn't be too enthusiastic, would you? No. <laughs> but there you are, we didn't get any choice. That's looking down from the bridge. This was a gun pit by the bridge. And that building that you can see with the, was the local chateau, which was a, I think it was a maternity hospital at the time. But the trouble was that snipers were up on the roof there and they were a bit, uh, made a bit of a mess of some of the boys. Now that's a bunch of the pilots after they got back into England. Um, my second pilot is Peter, the chap in the background there with his steel helmet on, because I think a lot of his kit was still in our glider under the water. And the, the, the officer right on that edge of the picture is Brigadier Chatterton, George Chatterton, who was a commander glider pilot. But uh, with the exception of uh, Peter and another chap who lives out in, in uh, Canada and myself, we're the only three left of the 12 that uh, took on the, uh, did the job. But that's the story of how we took Pegasus Bridge and... Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it.